Tenakota Katoa. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming out this evening. Um, we've got a really good turnout um, for our public panel. Um, so I'm Nessa Lynch. I'm a faculty member here, and I'm the chair of the steering committee um, that organized the symposium that we've just had for the last two days. Um, so I'm just going to make some brief remarks before introducing our panel, um, and then we can get our discussions underway. Um, so I have the pleasure of chairing this panel, which is the public event um, which concludes our two days of the symposium. So many of our symposium participants are here in the audience, um, so our international experts have been absolute troopers, um, so particularly since uh, three of them have travelled from the Northern Hemisphere, um, so they're doing really, really well. Um, so our symposium um, was... Uh, designed to mark 30 years of the Convention on the Rights of the Child um, and the Children, Young Persons and Their Families Act, um, now known as the Oranga Tamariki Act. Um, so the presence of our experts here in New Zealand has been made possible um, by many organisations. Um, so the Law Foundation of New Zealand um, and the Michael and Suzanne Bourne Foundation um, provided funding um, to allow us to bring our experts to New Zealand. Um, and also provided funding for three postgraduate students to attend our symposium. Um, so our symposium for the last two days was also supported um, by Massey University um, and the, some of the DCEs um, from various agencies. And so many other people have contributed their time and energy um, for the, this, to get to the stage of this panel tonight and the other events that we're having this week. Um, so we've had a steering committee to organize this week of events. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, Professor Rosanna Burke and Professor John O'Neill from Massey University Faculty of Education, um, Dr. Claire Ahmed from Bernardo's, um, the Office of the Children's Commissioner, so Judge Beecroft himself, um, Sarah Morris, Kelsey Brown, Donna Provost, and Julia Fipoti. Um, Sherelle Coyman, my colleague at the Faculty of Law, has done immense work in, in organizing um, the week's events, and my other fantastic professional and academic staff colleagues at the faculty. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce our panel. Um, so our panel are so distinguished that if I read out their bios, that would probably take up the whole hour. Um, so in the interest of time, we will, we will do very much the edited highlights. Um, so it's indicative of their international uh, reputations that we've got um, a very full attendance at our lecture tonight. Um, so uh, in order of, of this way, so we've got uh, Professor uh, Laura Lundy, um, who is co-director of the Centre for Children's Rights and a professor in the School of Science, Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, so we've got Professor Ursula Kilkelly, who's a professor of law at University College Cork. Um, so this is a fantastic law school that I have the pleasure of being a graduate of. Um, and she's also the uh, chair of the board of management of Oberstown Children's Detention School. Um, so next we've got Bruce um, Adamson. So his most important attribute is that he is a graduate of this fine law school. Um, but uh, in his day job, he's the Children and Young Persons Commissioner for Scotland. Um, so next, uh, we're very pleased to have Justice Clarence Nelson, um, who's a member of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. Um, he is the Supreme Court Justice in Samoa and is currently the Acting Chief Justice. Um, so last but not least, we have my friend, um, <laughs> uh, Judge Andrew Beecroft, um, known to uh, all of you as the Children's Commissioner of New Zealand, um, and before that, the Principal Youth Court Judge. Um, so our format this evening is each of our experts are going to um, reflect um, between uh, kind of, uh, eight to ten minutes, um, and then on the, well, we've left it quite open, um, so they're going to go at uh, the potential of the children's rights framework, maybe some reflections on what's happened over the last couple of days, um, so we've left it open for them. Um, so after our four visiting experts have given their reflections, um, I'll invite Judge Andrew Beecroft um, to make some reflections, I suppose, on behalf of, or from a New Zealand perspective. Um, so we won't have formal time for questions, um, but once we're concluded here, I'll invite us all um, to have refreshments and informal conversation, and I'm sure the uh, conversation will continue in that format. All right, so our speaking order. So first I'm going to invite you, Bruce, um, to come up um, and share your reflections with us. Or do you want to stay there? I'll stay here. Kia ora koutou. Uh, Fesca ma. Uh, Smisha, Bruce, Commissioner Hlonia, is doing your orca alapa. Um, Good evening, everyone. My name's Bruce. I'm the Children and Young People's Commissioner for, for Scotland. Can people hear me? Is that okay? I'll just, I'll just use my voice. Um, 
Uh, I'd, I'd like to thank the, the Boren Foundation and the, and the Law Foundation and all of the organizers for, for supporting my, my trip to be here. It's amazing to be, um, to be back home um, in Aotearoa, to be at, at this law school, which, um, which was such a formulative part of, of um, where I am today. Um, and the last couple of days um, spent um, with, with these experts and many of the experts around the room um, at, at the Hui on children's rights to, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the CRC has been um, amazing and inspiring. As the Children and Young People's Commissioner for, for Scotland, I've got the best job in the world. It's my job to promote and safeguard the rights of over one million children and young people all across Scotland. I got the job a couple of years ago and I spent um, the first few months travelling around Scotland talking to children and young people about what they wanted from me as their, as their commissioner. I asked them how they wanted me to spend my money, what I, want, what I should do with my time, how I should dress. Um, because what they told me is they wanted someone who would come and um, meet with them in their communities, who would speak to them in a way that, that connected to them, who understood their issues. They wanted me to put the hoodie on and the jeans on and sit on the floor, get my nails painted, the Lego, the glitter, all of that stuff. So I get to spend a lot of my time climbing trees and splashing around in rivers and finding out what is important for children and young people. But they also told me that they wanted me to be their fierce champion. Children don't have the same economic or political power as adults. They find it much harder to access justice when things go wrong, so they wanted someone who would stand up for their rights. In Shetland, um, in the Northern Isles of Scotland, they told me they wanted me to be savage in holding those in power to account. They're Vikings up there. So, um, so that's found its way into my strategic plan, and it's the approach that I take to, to my work. Um, in my office, um, on one of the walls, I have, I have a, a warrant from the Queen um, I'm appointed by, by the Queen on nomination of the Scottish Parliament. That's important, but I'm independent of government, so I can be that fierce, savage champion um, because my job is to hold those in power to account. It's a beautiful document with calligraphy, and at the bottom it's got a, a beautiful big seal with a unicorn on it because that's the national animal of Scotland. Um, and so, big seal of unicorn. Um, Scotland also, for, for any, anyone who's a Harry Potter fan, um, you'll know that um, the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry is in Scotland, so technically that's within my mandate as well. So, um, but all of, the, all of the horrible human rights abuses that you will have read about happened before I got my, my, my job, though, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's great there now. Um, but on the other wall in my office, um, I've got a big long glass wall, and um, what I ask all the children and young people that I, that I work with to do is to, is to sign it or draw me a picture or, or put a message Onto it, and that's where I get my real mandate from. The, the, the mandate for the work that we do comes from the children and, and, and young people. It's important that we've got the legal power, um, but coming from the children and young people. And, um, and today is probably one of the, the kind of few occasions I don't have a young person with me. Obviously, it's a long way from, from Scotland, and schools just started back, so it wasn't really going to work out, um, and funding wasn't available. <laughs> um, um, but children and young people are very much at the heart of my, my work. Um, on the wall in between, um, those, those two things, I've got uh, a poster of the, the Charter of the United Nations. And, and often when I talk um, about the, the, the human rights system, I start with that. The, this idea after the, the horrors of the first part of the 20th century, um, where we came together as a global community and decided to do things differently. So we, the peoples of the United Nations, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought unsold suffering to humankind. We reaffirm our faith in human rights and dignity, and we go on to commit to use the international machinery, international law, to ensure the fulfillment of rights. And the Universal Declaration that, that followed placed special emphasis on childhood as a time of special care and assistance. And over the last 70 years, we have developed um, a complex framework of legal rights to protect children. Um, and the most beautiful of them um, is the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which we're celebrating um, 30 years of. This comprehensive document that brought together civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights, and humanitarian law, into a document that starts with the concept that every child should grow up in an environment of happiness and love and understanding. An international legal document that talks about love and happiness and understanding, and signed up to by every, every country in the world, bar, bar one, which we don't talk about. Um, <laughs> this is powerful. And um, my call to action tonight um, for all of us is, is to use the power of this framework to make um, the lives of children and young people better, because there are really serious concerns. 
Um, in Scotland, um, we still allow the physical punishment of children. I know you've, you've changed that in New Zealand over, over a decade ago, and I would like to thank um, New Zealand colleagues for helping us um, try and change that in Scotland. And so soon we will pass the law to abolish the use of physical punishment, because violence can never be justified um, for the purpose of, of punishment. And, and I really salute um, you in New Zealand for, for playing a leadership role in that, and some of the amazing work done by um, Save the Children and others um, has been really powerful in influencing, in influencing Scotland. Uh, we still have an age of criminal responsibility of eight in Scotland. Um, they've just moved it to um, 12, soon to come into effect. The government wanted to congratulate it over that. Uh, I took a very different view, I think, that the idea of using the criminal law to address the behaviour of young children is unacceptable. Um, and the Council of Europe for a very long time has said 14 is the absolute minimum. The, the, the work that Justice Nelson and his colleagues are, are, are doing um, uh, at the, the UN committee um, is making that clear as well, is that a low age of criminal responsibility isn't, isn't acceptable. And we still haven't put this into domestic law. Um, and, um, and Professor Kelly will, will, be, will be speaking um, around, uh, around this topic, but one of the really exciting things happening in Scotland is that our government has now committed to the incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child into our domestic law um, by May 2021. And um, that's taken a lot of work. It's taken decades of, um, of arguing and campaigning. Um, and uh, when that commitment was made, there was a lot of delay. Um, government was struggling to, to draft a bill, so I brought in um, a group of international experts. One of the, the great privileges of my job is you get to pick up the phone and, and call your heroes. And um, both professors, Kilkelly and, and Lundy, um, are part of my, my, um, the expert advisory group that we set up, which drafted a bill, which I, I, I strongly hope becomes the government's model for incorporation in Scotland. And I'm, I'd be very pleased to talk to, to, um, to you about that, because I think it's probably the most important thing we can do for children and young people is to put their, their rights into law to make those rights justiciable. And we know from countries that, um, that have already done this, it's not just about the ability to, to litigate, but it changes culture. Um, the fact that rights are justiciable domestically changes culture. Um, poverty is a huge issue in Scotland, as I know it is here in, um, in New Zealand, um, and I've been following closely some of the work that, that, that Judge Beecroft and his, his team have been doing on this, because I know it's a concern um, um, here as well. In Scotland, um, a quarter of our children um, are living in poverty. They do not have um, enough to eat nutritious food. Um, we have poor quality housing. The idea that in a country as rich as Scotland or New Zealand, that we have such abhorrent levels of child poverty is unacceptable. Children have a right to benefit from social security. Children have a right to an adequate standard of living. If we can't deliver that for hundreds of thousands of our children, what are we doing? Um, because the Convention on the Rights of the Child commits governments to use available resources to the maximum extent possible. Um, that's not happening. We need to change the way in which we invest um, and Poverty, I think, is the biggest human rights issue in Scotland. Um, mental health, we're, we're not doing enough um, for children and young people. We need to do more on that. Um, one of the, the great uh, beauties about living in, in Europe is we've got, we've got uh, a Council of Europe framework and an EU framework for a little while longer. Scotland's still, still a couple more months um, that, that, that actually give additional strength. And one of the, the great um, things about being a children's commissioner in Europe is there's about 40 of us across Europe and, and we meet and, and come together and, and work um, collectively as well as making connections um, uh, to this part of the world. And one of the great things that um, we do as we do as um, Children's Commissioners, we bring our young people together. And one of the things that's been really exciting for me um, is working with, with young people on issues like mental health and, and digital rights. Um, one of the things that really concerns me um, at the moment uh, is about the uncertainty that children and young people feel. Um, a few days after I came into um, office, there was a bombing in Manchester, you'll all be aware of, and a, a 14-year-old girl, um, Ailey McLeod from the Isle of Barra in Scotland, was, was killed in that attack, uh, along with 22, um, 22 people. Um, and not long after that, there was a big fire in, in, in Grenfell. And I know that New Zealand has experienced natural disaster, and I know that you, you, you've had um, horrific um, extremist attacks as well. Um, that presents us some real challenges and children 
not feeling safe and not feeling adults are in control. That's, um, that, that's a big challenge that I think that it's important that we address. But the rights framework can, can help us do that. Um, and so my call to action is, as, as I finish up, and, and, and I invite you all to come to Scotland, have a chat with me um, during this week. Um, I, I really look forward to, to continuing this dialogue, and it's been, it's been wonderful, um, the, the hui over the last couple of days. Um, but what I would say is that the Convention on the Rights of the Child is, is 30 years old. It's hugely important. Um, and it's a powerful <coughs> tool that we can all use together to make um, the world a better place and to ensure that every child grows up in a family environment of happiness, love and understanding. Tēnākoutou, tēnākoutou, tēnākoutou katoa. Um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. I've been asked to say something to you about what my understanding of a child rights approach or a child rights lens is. Um, I, I'm a lawyer, uh, but I spent most of my time working with non-lawyers, with teachers and social workers and policymakers, explaining children's rights. And over the past decade, I have found that sometimes it's easier to explain that in the negative. I mean, people don't tend to agree, disagree with the fundamental principles of children's of human rights, dignity, equality, and respect for the human person. Who can be against that? And yet many people aren't for children's rights, or many people have understandings of children's rights that don't actually sit with the international children's rights framework. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about how I explain it as what children's rights are not, as opposed to what they are. And in some ways, it fits with a broader timeline of children's rights from the first 1924 declaration, which was really a charitable response to children's suffering, pity to the 1959 Declaration, which was very much about making sure children were safe and protected, protection. In 1989, in the actual Convention on the Rights of the Child, the emphasis was on empowerment, listening to children, their own views. And now I, I have some concerns about what I see and I'm describing as proxies. So what it's not? It's not pity, it's not just pity. It's entitlement, and that's the same for all human rights, not just the desk moved, and I thought it was the jet lag. <laughs> that was the floor, it was me, sorry. It's not just pity, it's entitlement, and I think Michael Freeman captures that beautifully, that the important thing about rights is they're not mere gifts or favours. The problems with gifts and favours and charitable responses is that we decide who's worthy of our charity and we decide when we give our charity and when we remove it. And that is the most, one of the most fundamental and crucial aspects of any rights framework. But it's particularly important for children because so often we give and we take away. And the important thing is they can demand, that you cannot demand where there is no entitlement. It's not just protection. Clearly, a huge part of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is about making sure that children are safe and protected from the various harms that they, many children face. But that's not enough. It has to be about empowerment. And in fact, in the work that I've been doing recently with children who perhaps are the most vulnerable children, children deprived of their liberty, children who are victims of modern slavery, the children who are most vulnerable often get a, a response that is based on protection and safety, but it, which is ultimately disempowering. And it seems to me that actually they are the children who most, most need empowerment, the children who most need to be heard, the children we really have to work to hear. And I've, I've suggested, using this metaphor, that vulnerability should never eclipse agency that actually when children are most vulnerable, we, make, we need to ensure they are empowered and heard. Thirdly, most of my work is around child participation, and I argue very strongly for um, children not just to be listened to, but for their views to be taken seriously and acted upon. But I have a concern in a, in a phase of children's rights that I think we're still in, that in some contexts and some professions, the whole of children's rights is now equated 
with listening to children, with the voice of the child. And I think that's just as dangerous, the idea that people think that because they're listening to children, they're doing children's rights. And it's not enough that that ignores a whole substantive package of other rights. And we need to be listening to children about their experience of those rights, not just what they want, and also recognizing that sometimes the views of children, what they actually want, would breach something very fundamental in another aspect of their rights. So participation is crucially important, but again, it's only part of it. It's not the whole of it. And then really where I want to conclude is um, where I'm at at the minute, and, and I think the last two days have crystallized some of this for me. Um, I thought that where I come from, which is Northern Ireland, where there is a lot of resistance to the idea of children's rights, and I thought I was coming to New Zealand where everybody would be for them, <laughs> and I found it's not that simple, you know, and I think the language of children's rights meets a lot of resistance across the world, and I think we need to unpick and unpack in our own context why this resistance. So that's one aspect of it, but the second aspect is I think that a response to that resistance is sometimes to rename and reclassify it to something less than children's rights. And these are what I think are the proxies. And the first proxy comes from the convention itself. And work I've done with Professor Carl Hansen from the University of Geneva, we have been looking at the way in which part of the convention, those of you who know it, will know there are four general principles that are around discrimination, best interest of the child, life survival and development, and the right to be heard. Uh, and sometimes this is presented as the whole convention. If you're doing the four general principles, you've got it. And again, we find that very dangerous. We understand the four general principles provide an easy access to understanding something of children's rights. But again, just doing that and not looking at those in relation to the substantive provisions in our view undermines a rights-based approach. The substantive provisions matter and we need to read and understand them and engage with them. The second one, which is more contentious in every context I speak about, is this idea of well-being. Now, I'm really for well-being. You can't not be. I like the idea that you have a well-being strategy. I think well-being in many ways is aiming for something much higher and more ambitious than what children's rights frameworks deliver, but it cannot be a substitute. It is a different thing. And if you want to have a well-being strategy, have a well-being strategy, but you still need to have a way of securing children's rights because they're different. They're about entitlement, they're about accountability, and they're about redress, which is very different from well-being. They're linked, but they're not the same. And the third one, I don't have a quotation on it, I, I haven't actually heard anyone in the last two days mention the Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm really glad about that because because they kind of annoy me. I know they're good. You know, I know that's a really positive thing that the world's governments are aiming to improve the lives of children through sustainable development goals. But they are a different thing to rights. And the clue is in the language. I say sustainable development goals, not immediate rights entitlements okay so they can be a route to the delivery of rights a helpful route but they are not again a substitute so each of these proxies makes me nervous but it tells us something about what the reality of a child rights framework is so that's a negative what i'm saying is i think it's, i'm not against any of those things i think they're all related to rights but what i the key message i want to get across is about cherry picking we take what we like and we ditch what we don't and i think with the important thing about a universal human rights and child rights framework is that we don't get to cherry pick which rights. We definitely don't get to cherry pick which recipients. Some children are more worthy or entitled to be seen as rights holders than others. That's wrong. And we don't get to cherry pick the raison d'etre, why they're there. They're there for state accountability. That's what human rights law is about. So what is my child rights approach? It is that about entitlement, it's a crucial word in a rights framework, the entitlement of every child to every right, not our choice to give or take away. It's crucially about empowerment. It's not just about having that and us rushing in to save them. It's about enabling children to understand their own rights 
and enabling children to be heard, listened to, taken seriously, and being able to claim their own rights. And thirdly and finally, it's always about accountability, but it's always about state accountability because it's governments who make these promises to our children and there must be mechanisms for ensuring that government can be held to account. We had an interesting presentation this morning for Professor Paul Hunt where he talked about accountability being about monitoring. Are you checking what you're doing? Sorry, monitoring the data, review, checking it against the standards, but ultimately it's always about redress that there is a way of ensuring that if your rights are breached, you can do something about it. Thank you very much. Unlike my colleague from Scotland, I, I apologize, I don't speak Māori. So I will pay tribute to the occasion and to this land and to the people of this land in my own language. E mō mua nā o whā tu lōa tu pa ia mā o lunga le a whia nei a whia whi, le a whia whia o tōu tanga ta whanua nei a tu nuo a o te roa. Whā whtai le tua i langa i lofa whāsua soa um fai un tato fa tasi ne fi fi i think it's it's a good approach to have four different um, uh, people talk to you about the child rights approach because we each bring a different perspective and uh, the presentation i'm about to give you is different from what my colleagues have talked about and I see with great horror that some of you uh, here from our symposium have probably heard this before. Uh, you're free to go to sleep, but, no, but please don't snore. My perspective, uh, as you've heard, I sit on the Committee of the Rights of the Child. And uh, so I look at these matters from an international child rights perspective and framework. And the Bible, as uh, Bruce has pointed out, is of course the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child in 1989, which is overseen by our committee. Uh, but we shouldn't forget that the, the convention doesn't stand on its own. The convention also has three optional protocols. The optional protocol on the involvement of children in armed conflict, or OPEC, you know, the UN loves their little acronyms. They have <laughs> acronyms for everything. So that's OPEC. The optional protocol on the sale of children, child prostitution, and child pornography, we call OPSC. And uh, the latest one, which is the optional protocol on an individual com communications procedure, or OPIC, which is just a fancy name for a complaints procedure. And we receive a lot of them. And uh, it's, it's a great uh, optional protocol and has not been signed up to by many nations for different reasons. Uh, but it allows children themselves to make complaints direct to the committee on any particular issue, whether it's a personal issue affecting a child or an issue of national importance in their country that affects all children. And uh, it's, it's being thoroughly uh, used at the moment to the extent that we're building up a backlog of complaints. But it's a great little mechanism, much to the horror of some states who are always the subject of complaints. As well as that, there's the general comments that our committee issues from time to time on interpretation of the convention. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with many of these, and presently there are 23, and soon there will be 24, because we are revising the general comment on what was previously called juvenile justice, but I can assure you we're changing that to child justice, and no longer should it be referred to as juvenile justice. 
They are very useful documents, these general comments. They are laboriously long, tediously boring, but very critical in understanding what the provisions of the convention are designed to do. As well as that, the committee has come up with a new format, and we call them the CRC Guidelines on Interpretation, and we've issued one recently in relation to the optional protocol OPSC, the OPSC Guidelines of 2019. Uh, again, these are guidelines designed to help states understand the provisions in that particular case of the, of the OPS protocol because we have found that a lot of states, when they come to report on the convention, no problem. But when they come to report on the protocols under the convention, they struggle with what to do, what to put in there, how to frame it. So we issued these guidelines uh, in the hope that it would help states who are reporting under OPSC. And this might be the first of many guidelines that will come out of the committee. Convention, as you heard, is signed by all countries except the, the nameless one that we uh, shouldn't refer to. Came into force in 1990. Pacific Swiss states were amongst its earliest signatories. I'm proud to say my country was the first to sign on 30 uh, September 1990 out of the Pacific Island states, although I believe Fiji probably contests that. <laughs> we work it out on the rugby field. The convention is the most ratified international UN treaty. Uh, and I put a declaration that they made at the World Summit in 1990 there because it sort of captures for me the intent behind this document. Children are innocent, vulnerable, and dependent. Also curious, active, and full of hope. Their time should be one of joy and peace, playing, of learning, and growing. Their future should be shaped in harmony and cooperation. Their lives should mature as they broaden their perspectives and gain new experiences. Wonderful, marvelous sentiments contained in the convention in the, base, in, the base, uh, in the form of four general principles, which I'm sure all of you are well familiar with, non-discrimination, best interests, right to survival and development, and the views of the child. I don't have the time to go into an in-depth discussion of the convention, but I just want to focus for, my, for the purposes of this presentation on the last two, right to survival, uh, life survival and development, and the views of the child. Right to su life survival and development, ladies and gentlemen, I believe is one of the most fundamental of these four general principles, because without life and survival, you can't talk about education, health, or anything else. It's fundamental. And you can't talk to a child who is trying to live from day to day about how important it is to get a good education or a good health care, because all he's interested in is his next meal and his next drink of water. I'll play you something. Uh, and this is a clip on YouTube. There are many likes like it, but I just want you to have a, a brief listen to this for a moment. It concerns the war in Yemen. In the villages of Yemen, it's the children who suffer most. Wherever you go, you can see the human cost of this war. 7-month-old Fatima is weak and severely malnourished. She's one of hundreds in this area alone. Her mother Sara tells me she won't stop crying. It breaks my heart, she says. The only thing Sara can offer her child is water. She's so malnourished herself that she's unable to breastfeed. Dr. Ashwag Muharram took me from village to village. Each time, we saw the same thing. Yemen has always been desperately poor, but the war has made things worse. With frequent airstrikes, it's too dangerous for people to leave this area. 
They rely upon people like a schwag and the little aid she can deliver. Today she's here to visit another child who's suffering from severe acute malnutrition. Abdurrahman is 18 months old, but weighs as much as a six-month-old baby. Born one month after the start of the war, he has been malnourished all his life, so he can't even walk or talk. <laughs> Lactose intolerant, Abdurrahman can't digest normal milk. Before the war, the milk he needs was widely available. But his condition now is life-threatening. It's not just the villages that are struggling. This war has forced 600 hospitals to close down. And lack of supplies has pushed this central hospital to the brink. Children are the most affected by malnutrition. Here, hunger has left one and a half million children starving. This is four-year-old Shaib. His grandfather brought him here with fever and diarrhea. Malnutrition has meant his immune system isn't able to fight a simple infection. And severe shortage of medicine means the antibiotic he needs isn't available either. The antibiotics we have will not treat the type of bacteria that he is suffering from. All we can do is provide health care with the supplies that we have. The hospital is overwhelmed with children. But in some cases, malnutrition has turned into outright starvation. Salim is eight years old. Once able to play and talk to his brothers and sisters, his mother says, although he's alive, it's as if he's no longer here. I never imagined I would ever see a child like this in Yemen. This boy is starving. It scares me that it may be the beginning of a famine. We hope it could heal the day. According to UN figures, there are now 370,000 children with the same level of malnutrition as Selim. Four-year-old Shaib's grandfather tells us his condition has taken a turn for the worse. and diarrhea and because they didn't have his medicine he passed away back in the village a schwag has some good news after six days of phone calls and negotiations a schwag managed to import his life-saving milk you've made me so happy and filled our home with happiness I hope I can do the same for you. <laughs> Poverty has always affected Yemen, but now there's a risk of losing an entire generation. <laughs> Noel al Magafi, BBC News, Hudaydah, Yemen. This is one of the horrible realities uh, that's happening in places in the world. And it is the children, the young, innocent children who end up suffering that may that may be in yemen which is half a world away and some may think it can't happen here well that all changed in new zealand on friday the 15th of march 2019 as we all know when a nutter went berserk in christchurch killed 51 people 47 males and four females including Four children. Those are their names. Mukhar Ibrahim, three years of age. Sayyad Milne, 14 years of age. Hamza, Hamza Mustafa, 16 years of age. Mohammed Hazik, 17 years of age. For those of you who think these kinds of events involving the slaughter of children is something that happens 
a world away. It's, that's no longer true. The war is not coming. The war is here. There is another clip, but uh, it's on the issue of the views of the child. It's a great clip. It's on YouTube if you want to watch it. This is a young 18-year-old lady from uh, Gambia, I think, uh, speaking at a conference in Kenya, and you recognize Mr. Trudeau there. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a great clip because, for once, he doesn't get to say a lot, and he just listens to this, <laughs> to this young woman go on about how it is important for children to be heard and for their views to be heard. And, you know, that is the second uh, of the four principles that I wanted to, to dwell on, the views of the child and how it is important to listen to children. In my reflection, we have failed the children of the world in many respects. We should, as adults who are running this world, apologize to these children. Because in many respects, like in respect of the life, survival, and development of the children of Yemen, the children of Christchurch, in New Zealand you have one of the highest homis child homicide rates in the world. We've failed to prevent and stop these sorts of incidents from occurring. And when it comes to listening to children, we're not too good at that either. I sit sitting next to my friend, Judge Beecroft. He's the children's commissioner. He represents one million children in your country. He has a staff of 14? 18. Representing one quarter of your population. How is that right? So when we do a really hard analysis, we really must acknowledge that in many respects we have failed. But the message I want to convey to you is that we need to try harder. This is the 30th year of the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Our committee is asking states to recommit to the convention because the struggle must continue and go on. This convention has changed children's lives, notwithstanding the failures that has occurred, and it will continue to change children's lives. But only if you are prepared to make a difference. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. The, uh, the second jet lag challenge. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be back in Wellington, to be in New Zealand, um, where we've had a really enriching uh, two days of, of conversation and dialogue, and, and um, I'm going to come back to that at the end of my presentation. Um, as we've heard, it's 30 years since uh, the convention uh, was adopted by the United Nations, and there have been significant gains made in that time in the implementation of children's rights. Um, it's clear too though there's a significant gap remains between the text, the words of the convention and the reality of children's lived experiences. And uh, my work along with Laura and others has been to really look at how we can give greater effect to the convention, in particular at a national level but also at an international level. And I want to talk to you briefly this evening about some of the work that we've been doing which really does stand to, to testify that uh, giving effect to the convention is a really important part of the whole process of, of implementing children's rights. So the imperative of, of what we describe as incorporation, this legal process of giving effect to the convention at a national level, comes from the convention itself. Article 4 requires and recognises states' duties to take all appropriate measures to implement the convention, all appropriate measures. And the Committee on the Rights of the Child from the earliest time, one of its earliest general comments, spelled out in quite a lot of detail what these general measures of implementation were about. And they divided them into roughly two types of measures, legal measures, 
including what the committee calls on full and direct incorporation of the convention, giving the entire convention the status of national law. Uh, and it goes on to talk about the need for, for that to be a justiciable process, for that to be a process that gives enforceable rights to children in the domestic legal system. But the con convention or the, the general comment also talks about non-legal measures, a whole raft of, of administrative uh, and other non-judicial non-legal measures which are also incredibly important in giving uh, teeth to the convention, giving meaning to the convention at a national level. They include things like child impact assessment me measures, child budgeting, uh, having a national strategy for the implementation of the convention, uh, introducing systematic children's rights training for all of those who work with and for children, and having um, independent national human rights institutions. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work uh, to, to track what states are doing around the world in this area. Uh, and while it's not possible to prove cause and effect, we can't say definitively uh, that incorporated states or states that have incorporated the convention have better rights compliance. It is true to say that it generates a level of culture and awareness and understanding that makes it much more likely that children's rights will be better protected. Um, and so the value of incorporation is evident from the research that we've been doing. And it's, I, I would touch on four particular issues here. The first is that it generates a level of ownership. So we heard, for example, in Norway, that until they incorporated the convention, the convention was out there in an international space, really not tangible to those in, in roles like social work who work every day with the national law. So when you incorporate the convention, you, it becomes part of your manual to do your work with children. Um, equally, it leads to greater levels of enforcement in countries that can again draw on it where you can walk into court with the convention in your hand and claim legal rights for children, but also in the whole other range of ways in which the convention can be enforced in, in relation to non-judicial, administrative and other remedies and complaints mechanisms. So it gives the convention teeth when it has the status of national law. It generates greater awareness around children's rights around the convention. Um, and it's incredible, I think, that after 30 years, there is so little awareness of the convention. But the process of incorporation, the dialogue politically uh, and in the public domain that, that often surrounds incorporation has, in our experience, proven to be a really important um, way to generate that wider understanding and appreciation uh, for, for children's rights and for the convention. And so that giving it legal effect uh, gives it status in, in the national legal system. And as we know how important law and policy is, it puts the convention right up there. Um, states have done this in different ways. They've given the convention sometimes the status of constitutional law, where that's relevant. Um, in Ireland, for example, and also in, in, in uh, more recently Iceland and Sweden, they're looking to give a full uh, constitutional effect to the convention, really putting it up there in their highest legal order, highest form of, of legal order. Uh, and other countries have taken the convention and given it the status of a, of a domestic statute. Um, there are other non um, uh, not non-full or indirect incorporative measures, uh, which have also been uh, been, been a part of, of our experience. And, and they are important ways to generate the kind of consensus that, that surrounds incorporation. Um, Scotland also has given uh, promise to fully incorporate the convention. So this is very much part of the, um, of the experience of states as we approach the 30th anniversary. The non-legal measures, though, are hugely important, and they're important in their own right, um, but also they're important because they build momentum towards more, uh, towards stronger, fuller incorporation. So taking the kind of non-legal measures I described, like impact assessment, having mechanisms to review and reform your law in line with the convention, incorporating, for example, the general principles of the convention, while it's not not enough is a really good way to start sensitizing uh, our, our national legal system to the convention's principles. Um, and one thing I would say in that context is that we've seen uh, many times Article 3, best interests, and increasingly Article 12, the right to be heard, to have a say, incorporated into national legal frameworks. We see it often, more often, in family law than anywhere else, though. And so we've started to see in, in countries like Spain, um, uh, and, and in, in the Nordic countries, uh, a move to, to include best interests in particular 
in areas where children's rights are far more less likely rather to, to be implemented, in particular areas like youth justice and in migration. And that's when we start to see the real test of implementation and incorporation of children's rights. Um, issues of resources we've touched on already. It's hugely important that we have this lens uh, on, on um, the convention to our budgeting process. And I mentioned training as a hugely important part of that process too. So what the evidence is telling us around implementation and incorporation of the convention uh, is that we have to strive uh, for a really ambitious strategy around, around giving effect to the convention at a national level. It must be incorporation in the strongest possible form. We must be ambitious about how that, that dialogue plays out. It must also have the widest possible reach all rights for all children in all circumstances. It's absolutely crucial that we don't stop at areas where children's rights might be familiar, like the, the child and family law system, for instance, but reaching out not just into areas uh, like youth justice and migration, for instance, education and health care, but also in areas like environmental law and planning, in areas that really matter to children's lived experiences of their rights. And then we also then finally have the most effective mechanisms that enable children and those who advocate on their behalf to claim those rights when they're not properly protected. And so those three elements are really, really crucial. Um, my final remark, really, reflecting on the last couple of days, um, we, had a, we had a terrifically uh, in, interesting, informative, and somewhat challenging, I think, discussion with a, an incredible, um, uh, incredible group of people from right across the children's sector in, in New Zealand, who uh, displayed every kind of, of um, insight, wisdom, um, experience, professionalism, and passion and commitment towards children's rights. Um, and I think it's, it's as, as Laura said, uh, interesting to note that while we might have hoped um, that we were coming somewhere we where we would see um, greater levels of awareness and implementation of, of the convention. It is, I think, um, reflective of, of the experience in our own countries that we still have so much left to do. Um, what I would say in, in all of the discussions we had was that the, it's clear to me at the end of the two days, as well as it was the beginning, that the incorporation process, the dialogue that, that can surround incorporation really provides a, a really an important opportunity to generate that awareness, and in particular, to, to reflect on how greater harmony might be achieved between the rights of, of indigenous Maori and Pacific communities in particular, and children's rights under the convention. And it's, it's somewhat surprising, I think, to me that that dialogue hasn't been more, um, hasn't been progressed more fully. Um, but clearly, this is a really useful mechanism to have that dialogue where we can bring all of these rights and all of these approaches together in a way that benefits everyone uh, under the convention and, and under, under the New Zealand framework. So I wish you luck with the ongoing work that you're all doing. You're such an incredible group to work with. And thank you to Nessa and everyone for the invitation to be with you over the last few days. Mana and a rail and ten a fighter at Tahura. A mini my current of my hair tie to the quarter of the Koto ten a rail. I'm standing here to start just to pay tribute. There's so many that I could mention here who have been lifelong activists. I see my old judicial colleague, I can call it. The one person here I just wanted to acknowledge was our first ever children's commissioner, Sir Ian Hassel, as he wasn't then. But he is now knighted at the beginning of the year, and we should just pay tribute to his fearless work as an advocate for children's rights. The subtitle for this brief concluding set of observations could be, Are We Getting Rights Right? And the answer is no, or at least not often, in New Zealand. 
I make one confession and five observations. The confession is it wasn't until after I was Children's Commissioner that I first read the convention in full from cover to cover. Actually, I was at 34,000 feet in the air en route to Geneva for New Zealand's uh, review as to our compliance with the convention. And I had time to read it three times in full. Can I commend all of you to do that exercise? Because as a whole, it makes significantly more sense than taking particular articles relevant to our discipline. Put it under your bed, laminate it if necessary, read it in full. Five observations. I quickly realised in Geneva that much of the rest of the world, particularly Europe, takes the convention more seriously than we do in New Zealand. Secondly, too many New Zealand leaders and parliamentarians in particular simply have no effective acknowledgement or understanding of the convention. When we campaign to have 17-year-olds included in the youth justice system, and we visited every single cabinet minister, at least a third of the ministers would say, the convention, Andrew, it surely principally applies to Yemen, Somalia, Botswana and Uzbekistan. We do okay. Can we just put talk of the convention to one side? And I quickly realised if we were going to win the hearts and minds on the under including 17-year-olds in the youth justice system, it wouldn't be, sadly, by reference to the convention. And what an indictment that is on us, given Article 3 that you mentioned, Ursula. Third observation is that much law gets made in flat contradiction of the convention, and we stand somewhat condemned by our passivity and inactivity when that happens. For instance, the ill-fated 2014 family law reforms designed to be better for children but with an underlying <coughs> ethos of less expense to the state actually was worse for children and was frankly antithetical to Article 12. I knew Article 12.1 regarding the right to participate and have a view to express a view freely in all matters affecting the child. I didn't actually fully understand Article 2, which says, for this purpose, the child in particular shall be provided the opportunity to be heard in any judicial and administrative proceedings affecting the child, either directly or indirectly. But that 2014 legislation watered down the right of the child's voice to be heard to the situations only when a judge decided it was in the interest of justice that the child be heard. How could we as a Western democratic nation, a genuine signatory to the convention, allow a law to be passed that was simply contradictory to the convention? But very little voice was heard. Fourth observation. I was at the Hui Afano yesterday for the Māori-led inquiry into the operation of Oranga Tamariki. Nobody there once mentioned the convention, and when I talked about it, from the indigenous Māori point of view, it was seen primarily as a Western document that individualised and atomised children. We had some work to do with Tangata Whenua to explain and work through how the convention is relevant, because it is properly understood. Look at Article 30, Article 29, which Professor Lundy was explaining to me. Utterly consistent with protecting rights to in practice indigenous culture, maintain those links. But we have some work to do with the 20% of the population who at this stage, frankly, would see it as irrelevant. The treaty is foundational, but the convention is complementary, surely. And the fifth observation I would say is that we have a responsibility now 
to take action. In the context of Oranga Tamariki, we had an opportunity in 1989 for a, re for a revolution. Now we have an obligation. The convention underpins that. I mean, the intelligent of you will recognise what's common about those four pictures and movements. Anybody has a guess about what's common about those four movements, civil rights movements, disability, uh, gender, sexual orientation rights, women's rights. My new staff from the Children's Commissioner. What's common about those four sets of <laughs> rights? <laughs> well primed. Yeah, initiated by, yeah, by those who wanted change. I mean, what stands out about the convention is that it was primarily initiated by adults on behalf of those who didn't have the same access to power. And without being paternalistic, do we in New Zealand have a responsibility to take action? I don't want to understate the position, but I'm not sure how many lecture halls we could fill in New Zealand on a topic about child rights, specifically the role of the Convention in New Zealand. Let us not delude ourselves that we are part of a massive national movement for Convention advocacy. I mean, some of us need to know we are it in our different departments or NGOs or government roles. Knowledge and implementation of the Convention will stand or fall on our efforts. I mean, no longer, if we ever were, can we be house-trained poodles on this issue. We were challenged today about courageous advocacy. I mean, that is what is required of us. Nothing less will do. We pride ourselves on New Zealand, don't we? The place where women got the vote, the home of the social welfare revolution in the 1930s. Rutherford spit the atom. We are a small, confident, proud, competent nation. We could do this. It's within our power. We could lead a movement. Movements like child's rights come from a group like this. It's within our power. Just as Nelson didn't quite get it right, 1.124 million children, to be exact. 23% of the population, just about a quarter, without a vote, certainly. Now, one of the most controversial things apparently I've ever said is why don't we consider having 16 and 17-year-olds getting the vote? I still stand by that. I mean, that might bring about something of a change. And people ask how well do we do in New Zealand for our children? This is a great little summary. 70% do well, some world leadingly well. 20% live in situations of intermittent but significant disadvantage and face real challenges. And 10% face chronic, long-term, enduring disadvantage, which does not guarantee adverse life outcomes but elevates the risk of that significantly. From my own point of view, while the 70-20-10 holds good across health, education, justice, well-being, poverty, and rights as they are being absolute and universal, our key challenge is with that 10% and 20%. And that's where we have to see meaningful action. Too many are left behind. It doesn't take the United Nations to tell us where the six urgent priority areas are. It's great, number three, we now have child poverty reduction legislation. That would have been a dream, almost a fantasy, four years ago. It has happened. What a terrific step forward. That should attack that 2010 figure significantly. We know number six, with the age of criminal responsibility or youth court jurisdiction, including 17-year-olds, should be easy enough to age 10 to 12. We've never had a 10 or 11-year-old charged with anything ever in New Zealand's history. So in conclusion, there is one area that could be a game changer. 
Professor Lynch and I disagree. I think there's real potential in the incorporation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child and on persons with disabilities into the Oranga Tamariki legislation. I hope somebody here, a judge and or lawyer, has the chance to argue in the Supreme Court whether the incorporation of the Convention into the Act makes a real and significant difference to practice. But someone here will have that argument, and I hope it's soon, because the law came into first force 1 July. I mean, it's an exciting and challenging time to be involved with children. I've been in the role three and a half years. I mean, I couldn't imagine a more challenging, fulfilling, rewarding role, but there is so much to do. Three verbs to conclude with. Today and what we have heard must enthuse us. I mean, you couldn't sit here without being enthusiastic. The convention isn't a dead letter. I mean, it's exciting. A quarter of our population depend on faithful application of the convention. Secondly, we should be shamed by our passivity. New Zealanders, I think, in this area and in many others are strong on theory but short on action. And the third thing it should do is galvanise us. Galvanise galvanise us to uncompromising action for fearless advocacy and to be campaigners for courageous change. It's great we can have four experts come and talk to us, but I look forward to the day when we are seen as a beacon, an immovable lighthouse of what is possible, rather than to have four experts politely tell us that actually, in my daughter's language, coming to New Zealand with child rights is a bit of a debuzz. I mean, frankly, we can and must do better. Tēnā koutou katoa. So thank you so much to our um, panel tonight um, for that inspiration and that call to action. Um, So we'll bring formal proceedings to a close um, and we'll invite you to join us for a glass of wine, some refreshments and um, to continue the conversation informally. Um, So follow Sherelle there because she knows where we're going. (laughs) Okay, so thank you everyone and see you for a drink.